Anyway, so what I was going to say though is, um, look, if you're doing this, if you're if you're spending your Saturday your Saturday, uh, hanging out with some theory bros, then guess what? You're one of the coolest people in the world, and nobody else gets it. And that's because you want to learn how to do ideology critique. So do I. And so if we want to do ideology critique, we have to look at an ideology at what it says it believes, at what it says that it does. And then you have to also look at what it actually does. And so this, uh, this, this distinction between opposition, antagonism, and contradiction is useful for doing that because if Zizek is right, then every, every ideology that can be critiqued can be thought through these three categories and so you should be able to find that everywhere so you go okay there's real antagonisms let's presume that there are real antagonisms we will call that the class of a all right but this ideology is saying that the real antagonisms are b c and d okay are these external or internal and then if these are external or internal how are these obfuscating actual internal and external contradictions. Now, one good example is if we're constantly blaming people in our own society, oh, it's single mothers. Oh, it's people on welfare. Oh, it's the immigrants. Oh, it's the rednecks. Oh, it's a Trump supporter, whatever it is. If you have a scapegoat in your society that is always being blamed through your media, and then all of a sudden you start always blaming, you know, Russians. Um, you've moved from an internal to external, but you're still obfuscating. That's the point. Well, I mean, and to, to return to Marvin's point, I mean, the example of the Soviet Union is really great here to make his point, which is so much of the Red Scare propaganda kept us from thinking about the inequalities in America, right? Like there, there's a really good point Marvin makes here where, yeah, an external antagonism also can have an ideological function to keep us from addressing our own internal conflicts. So that's very valid. So, um, okay. Slavoj therefore would argue that antagonism is universal because it will always manifest itself in some particular conflict. That's why, for him, to be a universalist necessarily involves taking the side of the antagonism that actually recognizes the antagonism. For example, the capitalist bourgeois class never recognizes class struggle, but emphatically affirms the organic unity of liberal capitalist society. There is no class warfare for the capitalists. Marx and the proletariat, on the other hand, recognize it. I remember Mar Margaret Thatcher famously said, there is no society, there are only individuals. Well, the ideology of this statement lies in how it erases or dissimulates, obfuscates, the structural antagonism within capitalist society itself, within our symbolic order. And it's funny how she basically wants to exclude, she doesn't know this is what she's saying, but she's saying... There's no big other at all. Not in the way, Lacan, and you know this, Lacan famously says there is no big other. But of course, there, in a sense, there is a big other for Lacan. His whole point, especially early on in his seminars, was showing how there's always the big other as the mediating third between dynamic, between two egos. And so when Margaret Thatcher says there is no society, there are just individuals, she basically said there is no symbolic order, there is no big other, there are only individual egos. Well, to a Lacanian, this is laughable. Um, to say there is no society is to say there is no language, there are no overarching protocols or rules to the symbolic order, and that we have direct ego-to-ego -ego relationships to other people without the mediation of the symbolic order. It's ridiculous. But the point is, and to a, a certain a, a good a good test, a really good test for if people truly believe that there that there's no such no such thing as a society, and all they have is direct relations to other egos, 
is just pull out a phone and start voice recording the conversation. Oh, yeah, exactly. Well, who's listening? Yeah. The, and another ego is not listening. Yeah. No, it's just the big other. There's the, the moment, big other. The moment you start recording or saying something where it's being recorded, the, mo the moment it's potentially there in the future, you, you're you in front of the big other. The big other is there with you. It's like when Jesus and said, where well, there's three or more gathered together in my name. <laughs> is it two or more or three or more? I thought it was three or more. The point, it doesn't matter though. The, I mean, the point is they're, they're together based on the mediating presence of him as the big other. Right. right. The reason they're gathered is because of the, the virtual third that isn't present there in the way that the other people are present. Yeah. Right. So, and I also love that you, uh, like my example of the recording thing enough to, uh, bring it in because I, I like that example. It's a great way of showing, like, yeah, if you're having a conversation with somebody and they whip out their phone and start recording it, you're sitting there going, well, wait, what the hell? And even though no third person is actually listening in at the moment, yeah, the it's like the big other is there. You've brought in this mediating third. And so, and, and like, it, it's almost there in a weird kind of, it's weird but almost like a spiritual entity like it's not there obviously like another person but and it's always there in the sense that your two egos are speaking language okay but if you whip out the phone and start recording it you make the big others withdrawn presence become very very present yeah it, it's almost there with the two of you in a way that it's that it normally isn't and obviously it was already there ready to hand. You just cut it, right. but you just kind of made it president hand, which also kind yeah, of causes the Heideggerian terms are helpful here. Yeah. And you said it was already an example. Like, so is that in one of your blog posts? No, I, it, that is in the updated version of the big other post. Okay. Oh, that's right. And I, and I, well, and I did. Do I don't think you have that version. Cause I, and it's again, what I've added are just fragments that I got to place within the place within the, the post, but. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if I internalized your example and didn't give credit and thought it was my own. But the fact is, it's just a good example. So we could have both come across it cause it's obvious, but yeah. Right. All right. So, um, but yeah, that's when, when she says that there, there's no society there is, she's saying there's no symbolic order. And when you hear it in those in the Lacanian terms, you just start laughing at it. Like it's delusional, but so um, again, the ideology of the statement lies in how it obfuscates the structural antagonism, right? If there's no society, then there can't be a structural antagonism, i.e. class warfare baked into it. So we get rid of society. We get rid of the structural antagonisms that structure that society. So, so again, so for Slavoj, to be a universalist means taking the uh, side in the struggle. The universalist position can actually invite those in the other position to come over and join their side, which is to say the universalist position of Marxist class struggle would say, hey, capitalists, like, just join us. Like, don't, it, it, this is not a whole thing like, Oh, we, 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 we want to harm capitalists or anything. The ideal would be for capitalists to actually join the revolution and say, we're done with this private ownership of the means of production. We want to be part of the revolution too. Right. And so the idea is that this, this kind of leftist universal project is, is what's different from a particular project, which is to say like. The KKK can't invite Jews and blacks to join their movement. No. Whereas those of us in in the universalist position, because the reason why is because uh -oh. position. You cut out for a second. Yep. There. Yeah. So you said the reason why. The reason why the KKK can't invite black people and 
Jews into the KKK, it's precisely because that position is based on particularity. Whereas the position of the uh, of, of the proletariat, it's about a universal emancipation. So he can welcome even the capitalists in. Of course, the capitalists would have to stop being a capital. But the actual person, even if that social position or structural position of capitalists we want to see negated, we want to invite the person who occupies it into the movement to join in the universal revolution. And so uh, the leftist emancipatory project can welcome all, whereas the racist or particularist um, struggle or movement cannot. So you see the difference between different forms of politics, the a leftist form of politics and a rightist or a conservative or whatever you want to call it that based on some sort of fundamental exclusion. And this is why it drives me absolutely ape shit when people don't just kind of talk in the you know you know in the register of like I would say the symbolic trying to talk about structures and systems and institutions and policies and concrete actual actions but instead get in this fucking imaginary ego feud with fucking I don't know even if it's like some douchebag like Elon Musk or whatever like the and, and, and no offense Elon you know I know you watch our stuff but you know it's that the, the, the fixation that people make on these individuals, on these personas, on these images, um, either love or hate, you know, this is me, I'm part of that, or I'm against it, this is everything that's against me, um, uh, goes a little bit further and also just starts to see people who are not recalcitrantly, recalcitrantly loudly in their own camp as suspicious and probably a part of that other and they when but the thing is is they will be seeing human individuals you know flesh and bone people in their lives singularities um as as sort of like just extensions of this this th this bad other right and and mm -hmm. the bad other is one that they think basically could be stopped with a guillotine they think well if we could just kill this set of people right we've we've got their addresses right like we know where they live they're real people we could just chop their heads off and then the flowers will grow back the you know a soft little sprinkle of rain will go by while there's the sun comes out from behind the the, the clouds and will we'll, the hills will come alive this well, and that, that this is point, that, in marx's is sense what we're skateboarding and that's marx's whole point with fetishism that i was going to say is this, this is fetishized fetishizing individuals um, and, and that obfuscates systems. So yeah, hundred percent. Well, and, and that's the thing, right? Let's be very clear on fetishization. Fetishization is when you take a certain person or a certain object, whatever that thing depends on a whole array of structural relationships, a complicated web of dynamics, right? It's when you bracket out the, all of the complicated multifaceted dynamics that make the thing what it is and it's as if that whole expansive web is actually just in the thing itself it essentializes it and reduces it i mean and that's why it's commodity fetishism so you think about what it takes to actually produce a box of rice krispies probably tens of millions of people in some way shape or form have played into the production of a box of Rice Krispies, okay? Yet when you go in the store, it's as if the Rice Krispies just magically grew there on the shelf and are what they are in and of themselves. That whole network of productive relationships that made the Rice Krispies is absent, but also present. It's what gives, it sounds funny because I don't know if anybody's been fetishistically and charmed by a box of Rice Krispies, but let's go with it. <laughs> Uh, may maybe uh, um, marshmallow fruity pebbles. That that would be a. Those are better, better example than Rice Krispies. I get I get the fetishistic charm of marshmallow fruity pebbles. I had so, it for fruit. I had it for Fruit Loops. I just have to say. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's marshmallow Fruit Loops, and then Fruity Pebbles decided to compete with them, and so either one, marshmallow Fruit Loops, marshmallow Fruity Pebbles. 
yeah, I get why there would be a fetishistic aura about them. But um, point is, so much work, so many relationships, uh, dynamics, etc., went into the production of a box of cereal. That that's why even a box of cereal, as funny as it sounds, does can have a certain fetishistic presence because. All of those structural, systemic, complicated dynamics that went into the production, they're there embodied in it, but you take that to be the essence of just the thing itself. And that's why it has a weird aura. And it's it's easy to see that. I mean, if it takes that much just to produce a box of Rice Krispies, think about the labor it takes to produce a MacBook Pro or a television, right? I, like I've got I've got one. I've got one that actually might relate to a lot of people. Um, I'll do a poll in the chat for to see um, who's actually seen it. But there's a video about the pencil. Does anybody in chat know what I'm talking about? Like, have you seen it? I'm going to say in the chat. Have you seen it, Michael? I'd say that again. Though. It's the Thank video. You, the it's, it's the. It's just like the video about the pencil. It's a. It's viral. What it takes to make one. Yeah, it's viral. It's on YouTube, and it's a really cool glimpse into all the different countries that are a part of making a pencil. And I've heard libertarians wax romantic about it because it's like, it brings us all together. And what they're all kind of just ignoring or not seeing, because this is a form of fetishization as well, is obviously the production process as which obviously involves a lot of exploited labor and mm -hmm. that that exploited labor is also being super exploited by the first world that has been using its um so its foreign policy right and its trade deals to make it so that it's able to exploit that labor even more than it could in its own countries right and this is when capital gets on that global stage and so the I mean, that'd be a really cool video to throw together is just take the video as it currently exists and then interweave what you just said about fetishization and what I just said and add some music because like right there, boom, that's fetishization. Is well, I, People are like, wow, look at all the things it did to bring this together and bring all these people together to do this. Look, even if somebody doesn't go for Marx's overarching project or the tradition of Marxism in general, it's hard to not. Uh, if you understand what he's getting at with co commodity fetishism, I don't see how you just can dismiss that. It's such a profound insight. And I mean, again, I like talking about it in different ways. I think commodity fetishism, it, it, it can be a difficult concept to understand. It's it, I think because it gets talked about more than, say, OJA or body without organs or whatever, it's as if it's an easy concept to get. And I don't think it is. And so there, I think the, the more ways we have to talk about commodity fetishism, the better. And one way I found is, okay, you just think about, you, you look at, I'm looking at my MacBook Pro right now. I'm thinking about what would it take for me on my own by myself to make a MacBook Pro? <laughs> you have this weird, it is a kind of intuition of like, it's beyond like my wildest cal dreams or calculation of like, how would I possibly ever make this thing right and what you get in this moment is like holy shit think about the amount of knowledge and learning and experimentation right. and labor that went in to making this thing possible and yet we act like all of that is just in the thing itself like the thing just has it and so so, yes, but I just want to like point out that just to make sure that everyone gets it, that the that that video that uh, libertarians will will wax romantic about when praising capitalism for making the pencil is expanding the scope and still taking into account a ton of this other stuff, but it stays purely in the imaginary and still obfuscates what's, what's happening at the structural, symbolic, and also real levels, which is the wars, the actual wars and CIA Oppression, yeah. ops. We're talking assassinations of third world, uh, you know, uh, democratically elected 
people. We're talking about genocides. We're talking about all these things. You know, I, I would love to read some books about the United Fruit Company and the people that it tortured and killed just to get this monopoly so they could sell us cheap bananas. But the 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 we're the, talking about this whole traumatic traumatic dimension of the production of these commodities we all yeah. use. Yeah, exactly. Have you seen Blood right. Diamond? Uh, Leo DiCaprio, right? Yeah. I actually I haven't. Okay. I know I haven't. But... Oh no. No. All right. Ev that's everybody's assignment. Go watch that, and then think about. Go watch other videos where people talk about diamonds, and almost all they focus on is the economics. But they're never doing it in a sort of critique of political economy way, which is to say, you don't look at the production and distribution and consumption of this thing in a purely economic lens. You have to look at it as also in its political context, the and and the the horror and trauma of war and of what's actually being yeah. You because know, if you just look at states and what they say about what they do at the ideological level, you're missing what's happening at this deeper level and it's still ideology functioning um but uh yeah i would say blood diamond is a really good example of the the horror behind these commodities that people economize so i'm just gonna i didn't know we would go here today but this is what i like about these discussions is where their real dimension you never like these these points that aren't scripted into it or planned or anything just want to say that if anybody wants a Lacanian reading of this sort of thing is um, Todd McGowan's book, Capitalism and Desire. In chapter four, this chapter is titled The Persistence of Sacrifice After Its Obsolescence. What McGowan does in this chapter is say like, okay, there's a sense in which ritual sacrifice has ceased to exist in capitalist society, which is to say sacrifice doesn't have these ritualistic ceremonies or spectacles the way it did in older forms of society. But he also wants to maintain, but don't let that fool you. There's immense sacrifice that organizes capitalist society, right? Well, one of his examples is, um, hold on here, but and we're talking about McGowan's book. But while you pull it up, I'm just going to say that Anne asked in the chat, what's this poll asking? I paused for a bit and I'm speeding up to catch up to live. And I want to say, everybody, that that's exactly how you do it. You got to pause when you got to pause and then you push play again and you can speed it up to catch up if you like. And the fact is, is you don't have to watch it live. You can always add it to your watch later because we do this just as much for people in the future as we do it for people who are right now because there's really no no separation between people in the future and people right now because we ourselves are also in the future because we are in this moment but this moment is a part of time in the same way that this place is a part of space and you're here in it with us right now so welcome it's so good to have you all here and um i wanted to read one comment really quick um actually two stephen clausen is still here so that's good to hear lucky charms all marshmallows equals jouissance says stephen clausen and then Marvin said something that I thought was a really good question. I know that I actually have a rule at the at the end of our channel trailer that says ask good questions. And I say that because I know some teachers say all questions are good questions. And I think that that, that people saying all questions are good questions can make some people think, oh, then any question that pops into my head, I should instantly ask. When in reality, you should write it down because all questions are good questions to write down and then look back over later, and then maybe ask. <laughs> At least hey, Dave, a couple of Dave, I have a question. Question. What's your question? What's your favorite flavor of popsicle? Marvin said, yeah, this is yeah, a good a question. Great question. This is a good question. He said, could you say that our tendency to make evil enemies in the face of a universal project could be said to be the lack of faith in our own projects? So I don't even have a good response to a question that good like i i mean i'd have to really think it through to do it any kind of justice i mean it's a great thought and definitely worth thinking about it, you know especially especially i mean this is a question for any of us on the left why do leftist universalist emancipatory projects also so often find themselves 
involving the persecution of some scapegoat figure? That's that's a heavy question. And hey, here's a follow up question because I I don't I don't I don't want to try to just respond to the question because it is good enough that I'm just going to think about it for the next you know ten. Years. I, I'm right there too. Like I don't I don't even want like it. It's that good of a question. It requires some reflection on it. But my follow-up question is, what would a politics look like that doesn't get stuck in the imaginary? Who would it attract and how would it organize them? That's my question. Because, I mean, obviously that's the, that's the problem for a new civilization. Because well, I mean, I, to go back to my example, isn't that what's disheartening about the film? And Have you ever seen Independence Day? Yeah, I the alien, know. the alien invasion movie. I need to rewatch it soon. No, I mean, I it always stuck with me, and I thought about this. This is maybe one of the moments in my childhood that I had a, a philosophical insight and didn't know I did. I just remember thinking, and I, I it was one of these movies I saw at the theater, and okay, it's not an all time classic great movie, but at that point, the special effects really blew us away. We were really impressed with the special effects in that. And so I saw it a couple times. And then it was always a movie that just was like part of my childhood. So if it was I, on, I, I'd, put, I'd leave it on in the background. I but I, I want to say... I've probably seen it twice. I loved it. And it's totally worth watching. That's my endorsement. But here's the thing. The message is is very pessimistic, which is to say the only way we can have universal global peace among all nations and among all religions and among all human beings is a bloody terrible war with aliens oh, so yeah that's right we right need... like that's the that's the message right oh it, it, it's in there we can't do that without evil aliens but this <laughs> is actually why there's that conspiracy theory about project blue beam where people think that Either Jesus or aliens is going to be holograph simulated and the news will take it seriously and it will be used to externalize our. In history. other words, the second coming of Christ did not take place. Exactly. Yeah, it'll be it'll be right. pure, pure simulation. I, I could so write a Baudry Ardrian piece on that. Yeah. So, OK, but what's your point about Independence Day? Bringing it back around here. Well, no, I already made it. It's just the point that it, it it's actually. Despite like the triumphant ending, all humans won, it's the pessimistic message of the only way we can establish global harmony is through a violent alien intruder. In an attempt to bring in new people to the world of philosophy and theory while building on relationships already established, we are doing a countrywide tour of the United States this fall. What's up, guys? It's Anna Dave. Are we coming to a city or a town near you? Do you think there is a venue or audience in your local region that would be interested in a lecture or facilitated discussion about existentialism, critiques of therapism, PMC ideology, self-help, introduction to philosophy, or the time energy critique of any of those things. This speaking and discussion facilitation tour will include the Pacific Northwest in mid-August, the Kansas City, Missouri area late August or early September, Philadelphia at the beginning of October, and really we're going to be all over the area there hopefully, so get in contact with us if you think that we should come visit your state phoenix arizona mid-october and socal especially san diego late october i say especially san diego because we already have our guide for the san diego region what's the difference between a host a guide and a volunteer you ask well thanks for asking actually the volunteer role is for people who want to put up posters or in other ways promote the events that will be occurring in their town or city whereas the host might have a guest bedroom guest house or a place that we can park our van so that we can sleep in our van we need to know if you would have like bathroom facilities or anything like that and so the form on the website is where you can tell us what you have to offer guiding on the other hand though people who love to guide take a lot of pride in their local knowledge 
A good example of that would be Michael Downs when I visited him in Raytown, Missouri, and he took me into Kansas City and we had barbecue and he took me to the mall and to all these other landmark places from his life growing up there. Um, but a more recent example would be my friend Michael in Poland who took us around Katowice, Poland and basically gives a historical and sociological analysis of everything and it was amazing. It was, it was one of the coolest things we've ever experienced and it made us realize some people just want to provide the space and privacy whereas other people want to take you out and show you around. And so if you're interested in being a volunteer, host, or guide, we have a special form for that. So please fill out your information and uh, get in contact with us as soon as possible so we can fit you into the schedule because we'll love to meet you, touch base with the local community. And if you don't think anyone else in your area is interested in the things that you're interested in, if you don't think anyone else is into this stuff, well, we might be able to surprise you. When I saw that poster, Boulderlard in Boise fucking Idaho, are you kidding me? It was virtually an, an answer to an unspoken prayer, you know, it really was. And I just couldn't believe that somebody was interested in the things that I was interested in, that I had been interested in for years and had kind of given up on in, in futility. I'd labored in solitude for so long, I had no one to talk to about it, no one to bounce ideas off. This tour is going to bring together a lot of people who want to be based in text with the people they're in conversation with. And yeah, I think it's going to be a fantastic year. The only other thing that I want to say is that Michael Downs' first book is going to be published by Theory Underground really soon here. I've got another book coming out really soon here. These books will be spread throughout the United States on this tour. So I'm hoping to be able to do some actual book launch events at various bookstores. Outside of that, I guess the last thing that I would say is that Michael Downs is gearing up to teach For They Know Not What They Do by Slavoj Žižek. We're putting out all these introduction videos and other interviews related to the topic of Hegel, Lacan, Žižek because we want to give people an accessible and sturdy basis in the discourse. The problem is, is that Michael Downs is very busy having to work at a wage slave job. And so if you want to help in freeing Mikey, make sure to go to his Patreon at patreon.com forward slash the dangerous baby and make a donation. Thank you. I would be remiss to close this out without a quick shout out to our patrons and our anonymous donors. Thank you so much for the donations that already we've only been around for a month we already got over three thousand dollars in donations um and so thank you and uh stay tuned for the app which is on its way there will be a theory underground app so the current setup is that it is a social media site built around courses where you can suppose that people who are involved in the discussions have a shared interest in the same or similar texts and where you can assume in a lot of the discussions that yeah people have read the stuff that you're reading uh that you're bringing into dialogue and so uh for instance the idea of the university by carl jaspers dedicated for him slavoj zizek's for they don't know what they do dedicated for him and then as people take the course over the years new people will be coming into that forum and so if you get in there early, you'll be able to see how the conversation evolves. And as new people add into the conversation, it'll bring back memories and like things that you want to work through, questions that you had with the first time that you read the text. And so I'm really excited for this. The reason I've built this website is because I think that this is what's lacking in so many other spaces is that ability to return, to be able to communicate after the fact and in a sustained way on a platform that's not attention grabby and annoying like discord and so stay tuned because there is an app on the way thank you to our donors if you want to donate go to theory underground.com forward slash support thank you